Hey, I wanted to do this yesterday. Just let the record show that. We wanted to just get together and just uh, go over a handful of items. We've obviously had a typically busy week here at the Pentagon. We've made the announcement regarding um, the additional capability in Iraq that General Casey sought and will receive to sustain the momentum uh, post Fallujah and to prepare for the elections, get ready for the Iraqi elections, which are moving forward. Uh, so we thought it would be useful to kind of pull together some additional information and put out what we can and take your questions. With that, I'm going to ask General Rodriguez to give sort of a summary, and then uh, we'll take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dorita, and good afternoon. Iraqi and multinational forces have conducted a series of successful operations against anti-Iraqi forces in Najaf, Talafar, Samara, Thara, and Fallujah. Specifically, Operation Al-Fajar struck a serious blow to the insurgency in Fallujah by denying them the use of the city as a safe haven. And Fallujah is no longer a terrorist center for command and control, supply, weapon storage, nor is it a base of operations. Today, we would like to share with you some of the things the coalition found as they cleared Fallujah. We found an evidence of an enemy who fully intended to fight the Iraqi and coalition forces and disrupt the process for a future free Iraq. They were heavily armed and dug in, and by that I mean there was food, water, ammunition, weapons stashed in the buildings they occupied, and they were prepared to fight. The insurgency used several hospitals, cemeteries, and about 25 of the mosques as fighting positions, clearly in violation of international law. Coalition forces also found more than 350 weapons and ammunition cache sites a number of torture sites, improvised explosive device factories, and videos of beheadings. The coalition continues to analyze the vast amount of information that we collected in Fallujah. And here, we're going to share with you some of the preliminary photographs that demonstrate what we found there. First slide. To better visualize how the mosques in Fallujah were exploited by the insurgents, Note the colored dots on this slide. Out of the 26 mosques that I discussed earlier, the blue dots are mosques from where Iraqi and coalition forces encountered small arms fire and rocket-propelled grenade fire. The yellow represents a location that was determined to be a command and control center. Insurgent snipers engaged our forces from mosques identified by the red dots and you can see the number and the spread throughout the width and breadth of the city. Next slide. Improvised explosive device materials were also found inside the mosque to include a reel of detonation cord that was hidden inside a bag of rice that was disguised, of course, as humanitarian aid. Next slide. This slide depicts the city of Fallujah with red dots that indicate where Iraqi and multinational forces found IED-making factories, and the green dot marks the location of the vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. Next slide. On the right side, a box containing an improved thermal battery for a surface-to-air shoulder-filed missile, as well as two additional handheld radios, and on the left, you can see several different types of radios used as the remote triggering devices for IEDs. Next slide. The red dots on this slide depict the atrocities discovered across Fallujah and, again, across the entire depth and breadth of the city. The combined forces found eight hostage locations and other atrocity sites. Such atrocities include human 
corpses rigged as IEDs, hostages found chained to a wall and a mutilated body, as well as executed Iraqi. Next slide. And here, although it's hard to see, you can see blood stains in the upper left and the sandbags they used to try to soak up the blood in one of the uh, hostage sites. Next slide. This slide depicts the locations of the weapons and ammunition caches. Basically, the description was there were one of these every three city blocks. And you can see the number there on the slide. Next slide. Obviously, they're allowed to keep a, a weapon, a personal weapon. All right, it's above house. and beyond that, ma'am. But anything this, beyond one? Yes, yeah. groups of them that were, you know, beyond the self-protection. This slide, here's an example of weapon, weapons caches in central Fallujah, in which you can see a pile of mortars and rockets. And this is just an example. Like I said, there some of them are smaller, some of them are larger, but this is the type of uh, cache we're describing here. Next slide. This location was a chemical lab, which is obviously in the southern part of the city there. Some of the chemicals found at the site included uh, hydrochloric acid, also ammonium nitrate and hydrogen cyanide, which uh, potentially can be used to produce a blood agent. Next slide. Also find at the chem found at the chemical lab was a Mujahideen chemical and biological book outlining instructions and formulas for anthrax, chemical blood agents, and other explosive materials. Now that we have driven the insurgents from Fallujah, we still have more work to do. Iraqi and coalition forces continue to take their fight to the enemy, and with that, we'll take your questions. Charlie. Um, Larry, I'd like to, uh, uh, just two quick things. I'd like you to, uh, to tell us as much as you can, if you will, about, about the Jacoby report. There have been some reports about that. And number two, to raise a, to raise a housekeeping issue, this, uh, you call this a, a get-together. The problem is we only have these get-together very occasionally, and I'd like to press your demand on behalf of the press corps that you have, start having regular briefings here. You know, for years, they've had two regular briefings here a week on issues from everything from Boeing to, to routine. I'm not talking about just war briefings. And I'd like to get some kind of promise from you that we'll start having regular briefings here. Uh, uh, yeah, so that we no, get, it, get, it's a fair I enough mean, point. You, you all have said before that, mm -hmm. that you'll have a briefing when you have something to tell us. Well, which seems to me that the, the way it should work is that we should be able to ask you things regularly. Sure, no, that's respond. a fair point. I mean, we, it's a we, matter of accountability to the yeah, public. I, I, I would certainly not ascribe to any interpretation that we've been anything other than accountable to the public. I mean, we've put off an enormous amount of information. Uh, we uh, have had God knows how many briefings on here. The secretary himself comes down fairly often. But I, I take the point. I, I take the point, and, and, uh, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll be as regular as we need to be. I mean, I, I think during the Fallujah operations, hold on, Charlie, I, you've made your point. I appreciate it. The, um, I think during the Fallujah operations, we had a, a, a coalition commander out every single day. I mean, and that's important, and it was, they, were, they were to talk to the Pentagon press. The technology doesn't always make it as good as you'd like it to be and as we think it can be, but I take the point. We'll, we'll be... Uh, You're taking the point forward. My point is that they're, they're there are issues other than war here. Sure. And while Christmas is a, is a difficult time because traditionally you don't have many versions, I'd like to, to you know, maybe promise us that sometime uh, quickly after the New Year starts, we start having regularly scheduled twice a week briefings there. Is so that, that the right? press can come out and ask you questions on, on issues. I'd like you to consider that. I'll take that under advisement. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. And anyway, on Next the Jacobi, question. Jacobi report. The Jacoby report. We've, uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about these reports. We've gotten, I think, nine or so reports that have been completed uh, having to do with the Abu Ghraib uh, investigations. Um, we've provided an awful lot of in, uh, uh, information on those briefs, perhaps not as much as you'd like. Uh, pertaining to your previous question, but we, we have provided an awful lot of information uh, uh, on all of the reports that have come out. The Jacoby report is nearing completion. The jo the, uh, it's, it's being reviewed by, I, I believe this is accurate, the commander of the Central Command. Um, Admiral Jaco or, uh, General Jacoby was asked to uh, review prison conditions inside of Afghanistan. General Barno, the commander of the task force there, asked him to do that. Uh, it uh, 
it consisted of uh, a kind of snapshot uh, of training of, of conditions inside of prisons. It did not look back to incidents that may have occurred inside of Afghanistan. We will have more to talk about when the report is complete. It has leaked. I would caution, though, against uh, sort of episodic reporting on leaked reports, and I'll give you an example why. Um, we've had another report that allegedly leaked this week that was reported in one of the papers about known as the Harrington Report. The Harrington Report, by the way, was a, a, a component of the Kerr and Faye Jones Report. It was an annex to that report. Uh, that Kerr Fain Jones report was briefed uh, extensively here, extensively on the Hill. General, in fact, General Kern has done extensive public briefings around the country on it. Uh, the the Harrington report was a component of that uh, investigation. Uh, the reporting on it t this week in the Washington Post suggested as though it were some kind of a new and un previously undisclosed report, when in fact it's an, it's part of it's certainly part of what we provided to the Congress. Uh, we provided all of the uh, annexes to the uh, current Faye Jones report. In, of note, in the um, um, Harrington report, uh, Colonel Harrington, he's a retired Army colonel, made the specific comment that we neither saw nor learned of any evidence that detainees are being illegal or improperly treated at Abu Ghraib. Now, that's a finding in his report. He found a lot of other things in the report. But the, the story that was sort of episodically attracted to this Harrington report failed to mention that, what I would consider to be fairly key finding in the Harrington report. And the only reason I make that comment is because we have been providing these reports when they're finished. Indeed, we provided the Harrington report as part of the current Faye Jones. We didn't release every annex. I, I'm told we didn't release every annex, but we provided all that to the Congress uh, two months ago or something. Apparently not, and I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I've been told that. Um, but the point I'm making is that it's the way it's being reported this week, it's being reported in a context that sounds rather different from the fact that it, the fact that it was uh, generated a follow-on report by uh, 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 initiated by General Fast to whom the Harrington report was delivered. She initiated a follow-on report uh, that was itself extensively uh, documented and included in the previous uh, reports. We're providing this stuff when we get it and we're putting it out and and when it's when things are episodically reported on uh, through leaks or through somebody discovering an annex that's part of a broader report, I think that does a disservice to the public. So we're going to, when the Jacoby report's complete and it's under review by the commander of the Central Command, we'll put it out the way we have it, consistent with classification and everything like that. The fact that the quicker, the quicker sure. the better on getting these things out. I will also note the Jacoby report does not take into account what we also know has occurred in Afghanistan. There have been reports of, of prisoner uh, abuse in Afghanistan. There are investigations underway that predate the, uh, we, we have the two cases of the deaths of, of detainees at the Bagram facility. Uh, there are, there's uh, criminal proceedings that have begun on that. So the Jacoby report all by itself without the context in the briefing having been leaked to the press, uh, I'm not sure. Again, I, I, I caution about the episodic reporting off of reports of leaked reports because it, it's, it's not serving the public particularly well. And I would, again, draw your attention to the f key finding in and I'm not trying to disparage Colonel Harrington's report. I've read the report. It's a serious report. He took it seriously. It generated additional investigations. But he, made, he did happen to make a finding as of December of 2003 that they found no evidence of abuse at Abu Ghraib at the very time when this abuse was probably occurring. And I'm not, again, I'm not disparaging the report. I'm simply saying that's a relatively key finding that, that somehow missed uh, the reportage. So. I'm not sure that's being considered. We're, you know, again, it's, it was provided to the Congress, and uh, I'm not sure what the policy has been on all these annexes. Well, eventually, we provided. I think we ended up posting the Taguba report with all of its annexes, so we may do the same thing here. Bye. That's good. I, I would like to second Charlie's point about the usefulness of regular briefings. That you know, the briefings you have given us for the Fallujah ones, for example, and others related mm -hmm. to the war have been useful and appreciated. Good. But the point is about regular briefings that are about any subject we'd like to bring up. You know. So sure. I just, just mentioned that. Absolutely. But my question is for, I think, General Rodriguez, probably uh, on your discussion about what was found in Fallujah. But by the way, you're, you're free to bring up any subject here today, too. Well, we may not answer the question, well, but you're free to bring it. Like, that's, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. We could do this twice a week, and that would that gotcha. probably still be Go ahead. Uh, Fallujah, uh, going forward from here, is there indications, either based on what you saw in Fallujah or what you've learned since, uh, that Sarkawi has moved to set up? cells in Mosul and other particular <coughs> locations outside of 
further. Well, the the uh, the insurgency and the the, the without uh, the base that they had in uh, Fallujah, what uh, you know is uh, looks like is happening, and uh, watching very closely is that uh, people move to other places, obviously, to uh, try to set up the same type of support base as others, because that's how they adapt to losing their base. So. Uh, there's uh, several operations going on right now to uh, to prevent that from happening, and this is part of the pressure that we need to keep up on the insurgency. So, for example, down there in uh, Plymouth Rock, you know, just south of that, that uh, has been going on since actually during the fight and, and continuing, and it's it's like that throughout all the areas of Iraq because as these people lose this base of operation, they move to other places, which opens up intelligence opportunities for us, as well as to build up the things, the capabilities that they lost in Fallujah. You know, you just can't do that without taking some risks and uh, and providing some intelligence opportunities. So those are going ongoing, and uh, we're uh, continuing to. Uh, I don't. I, we don't know anything specifically about the Zarqawi himself and the situation. Mosul connection that you know of. There's there's some uh, evidence of Mosul connection at this point, but uh, we don't have any solid evidence that that's where Zarqawi is moving his main base or anything like that yet. Okay. All that's being determined as it goes through. Not to sound like a broken MP3 file. <laughs> would be the vernacular of the day, but uh, I'd like to just underscore the. Are you seconding or thirding the suggestion? Third. Would this be thirty? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Value. Actually, Charlie seconded his own suggestion, so Bob was actually. Briefings, uh, as has been the tradition for mm -hmm. years and years and years. Uh, my question, uh, General, is we're trying uh, to be more transformational here and do things really different. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd like to transform for the better, not check. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, my question is about the additional uh, forces in, in Iraq, both the deployments and the extensions yes. and the force levels that that provides you. Uh, you said the other day that was for. Uh, security for the elections and to keep the pressure on the insurgents. Can you tell us a little bit about what the troops, the uh, additional troops will be doing to achieve those goals? And can you tell us, you showed us a lot of things that were found in Fallujah. Yes. Did you find things in Fallujah that are going to help you keep the pressure on the insurgents? Can you talk at all about that? Uh, well, well, certainly uh, any time you destroy a safe haven, a base and everything, we showed you some of the things that we've been begun the site exploitations on, but that's still in the infantile stage because we have not fully uh, looked at all the uh, sites yet that uh, we've uh, secured. So, yes, all that uh, information that we gained out of there we believe will help us in the future and what is uh, happening with the insurgency and how they operate. Uh, on the uh, second part, the, the forces, the additional force level that we discussed the other day uh, is uh, is for both the security of the elections and keeping the pressure. But the the the, uh, the operations and type, which will be determined obviously by the, the tactical commanders on the ground there, are, are mainly to keep the pressure on the operational or the insurgency by offensive operations to continue to exploit the things that we're going to discover in the wake of Fallujah by them moving, trying to set up safe havens and such. And that's the type of operations. And really, that's all I'm going to get into specifics at this point, because that's really a decision that's made on the ground over there. I mean, it's the idea to keep the insurgents essentially on the run. So that it is, to keep them on the run, the pressure, and prevent them from putting safe havens up in other places. So both the movement that they are doing and have to do, and the building up of safe havens and the support structure that they lost in Fallujah to keep the pressure on that. I think another consideration, Jamie, is that part of what was happening in Fallujah prior to this operation was a very uh, aggressive campaign of intimidation by the, uh, by the uh, sort of uh, insurgents and the foreign elements. And what this demonstrated was the, the will of the coalition and the will of the Iraqi forces, and it has uh, a, a campaign of intimidation is essentially a campaign of wills, and, and what has what commanders have reported is additional, as better and and more refined intelligence coming forward because people feel less intimidated. In other words, they now f have a better feel inside of Fallujah that this small number that was holding them hostage has been dealt with, and so they they're more willing to come forward. Now that hasn't led to any great findings, but it it does over time. That's how you get more uh, well, better. Uh, I just follow that. Are you seeing a change in tactics, uh, a shift toward? Uh, as you get closer to the elections, more attempt to intimidate, particularly the Iraqi security forces, such as today's Well, attack. it's been going on for a while. I mean, the int intimidation of the Iraqi security forces is clearly one of the uh, tactics that the other side is using, and, and we've seen that. Is that one of the reasons you had to send more U.S. troops? 
that the I, I wouldn't tie it to one single thing. I mean, what 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 General Casey wanted was what he described, which was the, what General Rodriguez described was the ability to sustain offensive operations where necessary and to provide a better security environment uh, with with troops that have been through an awful lot. And given that the rotation has been spread out the way it has, some of the troops that have got the best experience would would be leaving. And he thought that it was better not to do that. So I wouldn't tie it to any specific camp, uh, tactic by the enemy. But one of the principal objectives was, was to go after the intimidation campaign and to show the people of Fallujah who largely did not want to be living under the circumstances they were living that it's okay to come forward. General, the New York Times reported today that there were cell phones found, lists of foreign fighters, families to be paid, uh, specific intelligence. Uh, is that leading to other operations to take these cells down? All that right now is being analyzed right now and uh, will be used as uh, best we possibly can to take those cells down. And uh, any time you find uh, uh, things like that and do the analysis, it takes a little while to do that. But all that is being done. And like I said, we have done many site exploitations already. We still have more to do in that area. But yes, there's uh, phone books, there's lists, there's all those things were found as part of the, uh, as part of the uh, operation characterize the, the quality of the intelligence you've seen so far even though you're not done sifting through everything I mean no I, I can't but the bottom line is we, we believe it will help us in the in the future in the, in the near future here yeah. uh, Larry has uh, Secretary Rumsfeld talked to the president yet about what uh, about his future whether he's going to stay or whether he's going to go you know Jim I just have nothing for you on that and, and what he has said is what's going to have to do which is when he's got when he's ready to talk about it he'll talk about it it's just it's just not something I'm going to be able to provide any insight into. after all this time does it for there to be no no indication <laughs> at all he's, he's still going to be in office I just have nothing for you. When he's ready to say something, he'll say something. Talk to him, or, or you just don't want to call him. I'm saying I got nothing for you on it, Charlie. Larry? Yeah. Could you, um, General Rodriguez, des describe for us the situation in Mosul, what your understanding is of, of what's going on there, and pay particular attention to these bodies that keep getting found? Are they innocent bystanders? Are they Iraqi security forces? Are they maybe insurgents who have been killed and are just getting discovered? Uh, most of that is part of the intimidation campaign. Uh, most of that has been focused on the Iraqi security forces and the uh, Iraqi uh, people who were trying to run the city. Uh, as you know, uh, during the Fallujah operation, uh, there was a uh, there was a lot of uh, challenges at the police stations, and uh, we have uh, an operation going up there that is uh, is reestablishing the security in the city, turning over the uh, Iraqi uh, police stations back to the police, and uh, building back the uh, the the law of uh, you know uh, uh, free countries up there, uh, free uh, cities up there. So that uh, that was part of the result of this Fallujah piece, and you know uh, so there were some links there. And uh, we're uh, they're working very hard to clean up that uh, situation and right how now. How many police stations have been turned back over, uh, and how many police or security forces were killed? Uh, I don't have the specific uh, numbers of uh, police that are back on the uh, beat or those specific numbers, but we can get you uh, get those. But the majority of those stations were taken back, and uh, and uh, there's uh, calm in the city at this point in time, uh, relatively speaking. Well, uh, <coughs> Larry, Wait a minute, hold on. You're not going to second Charlie, are you? <laughs> okay. um, can you tell me um, what was the U.S. military fatality count in Iraq in November? I, I don't think we have the most refined. I mean, what we know is our general, is our uh, daily, as our updated tally, but I'm not sure by month we've got the data. Right. And of course, uh, you know, it'll take us a couple of days uh, after the thing to get the final thing exactly because what happens is everybody wants to make sure they got the right number because some people, of course, uh, uh, leave the theater and in, in route, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, die in route or up in uh, up in Germany, for example, where they take uh, many of the injuries. So it'll take us a day or two to get that. But uh, we're, we're a few days into December already. Yes. It, it, we'll get it out as soon as we've got it, right. I suppose. But we don't have it yeah. right now. On the tanker issue, um, Secretary Wolfowitz signed a memo to SASC on August 11th saying in roughly 30 days they should have these Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 emails sent over and supporting documents for the tanker issue. Can you tell us why all of them haven't been sent over yet and when they will go over? Yeah, no, I can't tell you when, that's for sure. Uh, I think the last number I saw is something on the order of 800,000 documents. Uh, uh, my understanding is only of six out right. of like 36 people. Let me get into it. Uh, the, the, we've established, it is the Secretary's desire to provide as much information as is being sought uh, that's appropriate to send. I mean, there are executive privilege issues, that, so therefore the White House properly has a, a role to evaluate these things. 
So we've developed a process by which that can be done. Uh, at some point along the way, we've determined that the inspector general is in the best position to kind of compile these documents and do the screening and the initial evaluation as to whether they're responsive to the request and to work uh, with the general counsel, uh, general counsels in the administration to, to uh, then address the executive privilege issues, et cetera. It's just a, it is a time consuming process. There are an enormous number of documents. It involves getting people uh, at the White House that have responsibilities to evaluate them as well. And of course, they're, they're busy with a variety of tasks as well. If it were simply uh, the kind of thing where you could print them up and cart them across to the uh, United States Congress, the, the task would have been accomplished. Because the Secretary's clear desire is to provide, to be as responsive as, as appropriate, uh, given the, there's a handful of considerations. That, for example, it's not anybody's desire that uh, emails, for example, that have members of Congress's name in it to be so there's redacting that goes on and then the Congress can decide how it wishes to treat those it's not our so it, it's a very time-consuming process I understand what you're saying but why then knowing this process I mean this 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 whole process has taken over a year knowing the difficulties why did Secretary Wolfwood sign a memo saying you'll get what you want in 30 days well you, you always hope for the best and then you get into the document collection and it takes time it's it's a it, we, we've got uh, We've, we've devoted an enormous number of resources to, to being responsive to this request. Uh, as I said, we, we, were, we were developing a process to provide documents relating to a small number of officials. Somewhere along the way, uh, I think the number was 26 or 27 additional officials documents were sought. So it's, it hasn't exactly been, uh, and this is understandable, but it hasn't exactly been, here's a list of things we'd like go to work on it. The list itself has been evolving and, and we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with complicated issues of privacy. We're dealing with complicated issues of executive privilege and, and complicated issues of, of, uh, of um, sort of propriety when it comes to, to the names of people who aren't, you know, you may have an email and we've all seen email strings that could have three responsive lines in an email that has a, a string of 27 different back and forths. So somebody's got to go through and analyze that and say, well, these three lines are responsive, and the following 24 are not, so they have to be redacted. It's, it's, uh, it is not simply push the send button and it goes over to the Senate. But, Larry, there are also so. those who would say and you might be dealing with comprehensive issues of embarrassment, too. For instance, the Secretary Roche's emails that were finally sent over to Congress and, uh, and mm -hmm. Senator McCain. It's certainly it nobody's interest. Friendly. Look, at, those emails say what they say, and the Secretary of Defense's position all along has been, we're going to be responsive to the request. And it's not, not, it's not a consideration. I mean, it is a fact that there will be emails that out of context will seem, uh, seem to be, there was an article in one of the papers yesterday that, that obviously was, was a colorful exchange. We've all exchanged emails. So that's what you get when you look at emails. It's raw documentation. It, it's also important. It, this is kind of a new thing. I mean, this is, you know, the treatment of emails is, is, a, is a sort of new branch of privacy that we're all wanting to make sure we do proper and right. But it is not, has nothing to do with whether anybody's going to be embarrassed. We're going to do the right thing, and the right thing is to be as responsive as possible to this request. And being responsive is just taking time. Why would you redact the names of members of Congress from emails? Or it, it's our view that uh, if some, it's third hand, Charlie. So you've got an official here talking to a, an official at uh, a company, and they mention some senator's name. Now, is that fair? It's not our job to say this secondhand conversation in which the member had no idea he was even being discussed is going to, we're going to dump those emails because we know those emails are going to be become public. So it's up, to, that's a, something we're deferring to the chairman of the committee on how he wants to handle it, but it's our druther that we, we're not going to do that. It's not, it's just not right. It's, it's third hand <coughs> and second hand stuff. So, yeah, Eric. General, uh, that short stretch of road between central Baghdad and the airport comes under almost daily attack, as you know, and British and U.S. embassies have barred their employees from using it. Uh, why can't the U.S. military do a better job of securing that road? Are there any plans, without getting into operational details, for the military to do more to protect that road? Uh, for yes. many Iraqis, it's become a symbol of the lack of security. Yes, as you know, uh, we've uh, had continuous operations along that road to do that, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but uh, I don't have any specifics on those operations or how we're uh, going to do that. Larry. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious the campaign of intimidation you're talking about against the security forces in Iraq. Yes. What effect is that having on the effort to recruit 
and train these people who are so critical to the long-term stability of the country. Uh, yeah, the uh, we we continue to uh, have sufficient people signing up uh, to be uh, to the recruiting thing. We continue to get the people over there who are uh, ready to fight for a future Iraq. And uh, of course, they have uh, many of them have sacrificed their lives in pursuit of that. And uh, we are. Uh, we're uh, happy that uh, the, on the way the uh, development of the Iraqi security forces is coming along. It's not cut into. It's not cut into the, cut into the recruiting problem. That's correct. And it's worth noting the fact that we don't have the precise numbers, and we'll get right over to you. But the uh, a, a, a large number of Iraqi security forces have been killed. They've been killed in action. They've been killed through the intimidation campaign. They've been they've been execution style assassinations. And yet, thus far, uh, Iraqis are coming forward to, to serve. It's a uh, it's. As the president said, it's time for Iraqis to go to the polls because they are they are trying to take control of that country, and and uh, Iraqi security forces are are really in the front of that effort. So, uh, we were told repeatedly during the Fallujah uh, assault that the Iraqi security forces were performing well in tandem with uh, coalition forces, but reports coming from Iraq increasingly s seem to suggest that they're not <coughs> that they're they're not up to the job. They can't perform. There's not discipline. There's not leadership. Where does that exactly stand? Who's right? The uh, you know you, the uh, you got a, a full range of uh, of uh, effectiveness over time, and, and you understand uh, a lot of the uh, the training that's going on. For example, and you, you got to remember we're building this army from scratch. So as they go through their initial training, and uh, and uh, work through those pieces, and then they go out for operations, there's a growth period between the time that they graduate from the training, the initial training in the school, until they can do a a tough operation like a military opera, uh, operation in urban terrain in concert with coalition forces. So that higher level of coordination and everything is, is at the higher range of what we're talking about doing in which some of the uh, Iraqi uh, units were able to participate in in Fallujah back to the ones that have just graduated from the school and are still working those, the leadership development, the mentoring that's so critical to them moving from the, the, the training to the uh, the, the uh, level of a uh, proficient unit enough to move forward until they are really a, a unit that can do a tough operation in a uh, urbanized urban uh, terrain in concert with coalition forces. So there is a full range of that out there, and that's part of the reason why it depends on what time and what units you're asking based on where they are in that developmental process. How many are at the more complete end of it than at the beginning? And you know, you say it depends on the situation, but where does where, where does the bulk of it lie? Um, I I don't have the exact uh, figures on that and everything, but like I said, it has been con a continual improvement uh, from the last uh, seven months. And and as you know, in a last April we had some huge challenges with trying to push the people too far too fast, and we had some uh, setbacks. So. Uh, they have taken a uh, – they relooked that and continue to grow that Iraqi security forces over time, and uh, that's been moving forward, constantly improving, and the commanders on the ground are happy with their ability of the, the units that are that good to interact with coalition forces. Yeah, Mary. Uh, yeah, Mary um, the Harrington report, we're told, was passed to General Fast, who passed it to General Sanchez, who launched an investigation into the activities of this Task Force 121. Um, can you tell us what the status of that investigation is? I mean, did, was it rolled into the Formica investigation or, or well, a separate uh, one? Um, I'm going to do my best on this one, but the Harrington report generated uh, something that became a, a fifth, what they call this 15-6 inquiry uh, by, I think, a Captain Cox. And that, that generated itself uh, a large number of sort of findings and imp recommended improvements, and, and that occurred about the time that the dis that the uh, abuses were coming to light. I think it was uh, in late January of 2003 uh, when that report was completed and provided. And at that point is when a, a host of other investigations began and ultimately uh, the General Formica investigation on Special Operations Forces, which will undoubtedly find some of the same things. I mean, we've got Special Operations Forces that are already involved in courts martial based on, uh, and that wasn't, I think, reflected in the Washington Post story. But right. So I, 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 I'm not sure that I'm able to parse exactly the lineage of the Harrington to Cox to Formica, but I, I know that it all happened almost contemporaneously with the dis disclosure of the, uh, the first public disclosure of what we learned in mid-January, and at that point a number of investigations began. And I would also say, looking back, there had already been some reviews. General Miller had already gone over and found 
a lot of the same things to some extent that, Gen that Colonel Harrington found. In other words, a prison system that needed uh, attention in terms of resources and, and, and their doctrine needed a uh, review and that sort of thing. And a lot of that's ob obviously been provided. So. Yes. By, the, by the way, that's how we used to do it. We used to say new subject, and then <laughs> all the reports would get to ask about that subject. Nobody got cut off. And, and we went to the next subject. How, okay, I should do this more often. I could learn that. Yeah. Um, but my subject is, is uh, General, My General Meyer said yesterday. Yeah, I got me to kick around with that. His, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. New subject. New subject. <laughs> Yes, sir. General Myers said yesterday that his concerns with the intelligence reform bill appeared to have been addressed in the conference committee on the Hill, but uh, Congressman Hunter's staff suggested there's still significant disagreement about the chain of command <coughs> issue. It, it, can you just tell us what your understanding is of whether the, uh, the concerns about uh, cha the, the chain of command and, and getting intelligence to troops on the field has been resolved in the, uh, in the conference? Uh, New subject? <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to add what General Meyer said yesterday. And, and you know, the, the negotiations on that legislation are, are being uh, intensely uh, engaged by, uh, with the White House and the committees, and, and we're just going to, I just have nothing to add to what, I have nothing to add to what the chairman said yesterday. General Myers was under any pressure from either the White House or uh, Secretary Rumsfeld to absolutely change his position? Absolutely not. <coughs> and, and the last uh, subject is, uh, your uh, nomination to be Assistant <laughs> Secretary of Defense, Defense for Public Affairs has been withdrawn by the White House? I, I asked that it be withdrawn, but let me correct something first, and then if okay. anybody really cares about that last one, I'll be happy to talk about it. I said C Captain Cox. I've just been corrected. Lieutenant Colonel Natalie Lee did the 15-6 investigation. Is that right? I don't know where I got Cox. There's a lot of these uh, reports. That Natalie, I've, Lee. Natalie Lee did a investigation as the result of the Harrington report. And I think my timing remains the same. It, it, it came out about the end of January and other things. Do you know what the was that, that report? Uh, I, I don't know, and I'll see if we can learn. I don't know what became of it, if it just got rolled into Taguba at that point, or I'm not sure what. As I said, a lot of other investigations began around that exact same time. So. And why did you ask for your nomination? It, was, it just seemed uh, as though the, the, the 108th Congress was coming to a close. I thought there was a possibility that uh, – I had been nominated a, uh, a year ago, more than a year ago now. My, the Senate had taken no action on my nomination, and it, it just seemed like a, during a period of transition to be confirmed at that point, were I to be confirmed, uh, when there's a transition going on, just, I just thought it would be better to have a clean slate start over. There's a new Congress coming. There's, you know, it gives everybody an opportunity to take another look at everything. And so as a result, I'll just continue what I'm doing. Uh, inadequately, but <laughs> <laughs> that's all I've got. Thank you, folks. Are you saying there is a new operation underway? It's an ongoing operation. But is something going to change? Because it's gotten progressively worse. We'll see how it goes. Do you think, do you think the 82nd will help with that, General? You said that the 82nd will be mostly in Baghdad. Do you think they'll help? Maybe on eight times a week. <laughs>